News continues here in RT. The Friends of Syria group of nations meeting in Qatar have defended their efforts to arm rebels. And the U.S. Secretary of State said America will increase political and military support to the Syrian opposition. John Kerry said that President Assad has escalated the conflict by seeking help from Iran and Lebanese fighters. He did not address, though, the fact that Qatar has been supporting Syria's rebels and pledged to continue doing so. The Free Syrian Army Military Command on Friday claimed opposition fighters have received weapons that can change the balance of power. Meanwhile, the UN has rejected Washington's claims that the Syrian government used chemical weapons, saying it wasn't at all convinced. Well, these accusations were followed by a US decision to provide weapons to the rebels. RT's Paula Sleer reports. United Nations experts say that they do not confirm the claims put forward by the United States, Britain and France that the Damascus regime used chemical weapons against the Syrian rebels. They say that despite the fact that these three countries collected evidence on the ground, such as blood, tissue and soil samples, it is inconclusive and that they will have to send their own investigators to conduct a personal investigation inside Syria. This is what the UN had to say. We cannot say what the, what the weapons were. What the, we cannot say what the agents were. We don't talk about weapons. We cannot say who used them, and we cannot say how they were even delivered. We cannot say anything concrete. So you are casting serious doubt into what the West has supplied, the UN? The US, the British, the French, they supplied what they say is verifiable proof. They have. They haven't supplied that to us. It's important to note that based on these unsubstantiated claims by the United States, Britain and France that Assad used chemical weapons, last week the American President Barack Obama ordered the CIA to start supplying weapons to the Syrian rebels. He said to quote him that the Damascus regime had crossed a red line set by Washington. Now the Russian President Vladimir Putin has reiterated that any supply of weapons to the Syrian rebels is in violation of international law. And he he has warned that it will only further destabilize the situation on the ground. I can barely understand why one would supply arms to the unlawful rebel groups in Syria when we don't even know who those groups consist of. If Washington acknowledges one of the key bodies of the opposition forces, the Al Nusra Front, as a terrorist organization officially and admits its link to Al Qaeda, how can they then debate arming that same opposition? Where would those weapons end up? The point that the Russian president makes that we do not know who composes the opposition and where these weapons will end up is a point that is raising concern in the international community. For 27 months, this conflict has been going on, and at this stage, it seems to be showing no signs of letting up. Paul RT on the Israeli Syrian border. Well, let's get more on Syria from Carl Sharro, who writes extensively about the Middle East in his blog. Carl, it looks like a deal has now been sewn up uh, with the backers of the Syrian opposition agreeing to supply arms. So will this now change the conflict? I don't think so. I mean, if there is a change, it will be a change towards more escalation and transforming the Syrian uprising further into bogging it down into a civil war and increasing, obviously, the regional conflict dynamics and probably beyond that, uh, the international uh, the, uh, conflict dynamics because we see, you know, different sides, the West and, and Russia taking different sides in Syria. So I think it was a really unwise move and there have been enough uh, uh, policy within policy circles within both Britain and the U.S. warning of such moves, and uh, but I, I, I think the the group collectively didn't um, pay attention to these kind of warnings about the possibility of escalating the conflict further, and obviously more loss of life and extending the conflict isn't something that Syria needs now after two and a half years of uh, intensive civil war. Well, Qatar's prime minister, he would disagree with you. He said that providing arms may be the only means of achieving peace. Why is he so keen to pursue that route militarily? I think Qatar has actually um, kind of from from very early on taken a hardline stance on Syria where its legitimacy and its regional standing uh, is uh, dependent on the outcome in Syria. And I, uh, some of the reason for that is had tried to very, very early on to uh, kind of per convince uh, President Assad to pursue a more softer uh, response and probably include the opposition. And that didn't happen. Uh, but I think what we really need to look at here is 
the, the, the constellation that used to be in the Western camp, which um, uh, probably 20 years ago used to be very clear about how it operated within the Middle East. And now we see the tensions within that. So, for example, between Qatar and Saudi Arabia, but even there's a big discord between the way Qatar operates and how much Qatar is willing to uh, um, kind of um, escalate the, the military situation, whereas the, uh, there's some reluctance on the side of the Obama administration to actually do that. And some total of that is you've got an incoherent camp on one side uh, that's pursuing all this sort of contradictory policies at the end of the day, being arming rebels that are still not clear who they are or what their aims, political aims would be if they do take power in Syria. So you've got really, without exaggeration, a recipe for disaster, all we're doing at the moment is risking, uh, and it's a very serious risk, inflaming the conflict further and further and intensifying its magnitude by pouring oil on the fire by sending in more weapons. Well, let's talk more about those regional implications. The Friends of Syria group have demanded that Lebanon and Iran stay out of the conflict. But, of course, with Arab Gulf states already deeply involved, just how realistic is that? I don't think it's realistic at all. I mean, let's just look at Lebanon. The Lebanese government obviously doesn't have any power to stop neither Hezbollah nor the other groups that are fighting on the side of the rebels in uh, Syria. Um, Iran, I mean, let's look really clearly about the involvement of Iran within the Syrian conflict. It's come in response to Western moves, which are not calculated, and, and, and Gulf moves to further uh, kind of deepen their involvement in the Syrian conflict and maximize the political potential they might come from the outcome over there. So I think that, again, let's say the pro-Western camp is not really calculating that its deepening involvement as every step of the way led to further involvement by the other side. And you could say who started it at this moment, but the bigger picture is every step of escalation is going to be followed by escalation from the other side. There isn't going to be a magic moment when all the sides supporting the Syrian regime are going to say, uh, well, yes, if you're going so intense on arming the Syrian rebel and intervening in Syria while well, we're going to walk out of the situation. That's just not going to happen. What they will do is they will try to kind of consolidate their gains over there, prevent the collapse of the regime, which will mean ultimately a far more damaging regional war and further involvement for all sides. Okay, Carl, thank you very much indeed for your thoughts on this. Carl Sharrow live here on RT. Thank you.